Let us pray. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I know what that's like. Anybody ever said that to you? I know what that's like. When people have said this phrase to me, I have one of two reactions. The first is to get mad. How could you possibly know what it's like for me? I react this way when the person I'm talking to centers themselves. If I've just lost a loved one, for example, and the person spends the next 30 minutes telling me about that time in third grade when they lost their math homework, I get mad because it's not the same. In those cases, the sentence, I know what that's like, is used usually as an excuse so that the person doesn't have to sit with me in my own pain. It's used as a way of taking control of my story, and in a strange way, it's used to take away my power by making me the one who listens instead of the one who gets to talk. I know what that's like sometimes makes me mad when I hear it. But sometimes, other times, when I hear someone say, I know what that's like, I feel curious have the sense that maybe they really do know what it's like. There's something about the depth of compassion in their eyes, the quiet voice that they use to respond to me that makes me feel more seen and not more invisible. It makes me feel, in those cases, like somebody is sitting next to me and not standing over at me, looking down. And if I'm curious enough, when the person says to me, I know what that's like, I'll say, you do? And they'll give me a little peek into their story. And sometimes it's true. They really do know what it's like, and they've experienced pretty much the exact same thing that I have, but more often than not, their historical biographical experience is not the same as mine, but their emotional or spiritual experience is. And I feel more connected, more understood, more like I am part of something that is larger than myself. I know what that's like. Today's gospel lesson tells the story of two of Jesus' disciples who are pretty sure that they know what it's like to be Jesus. They begin with a fundamental misunderstanding of what Jesus is about in the world. Jesus clearly has power. They know it. They've seen it. He has the power to heal, to restore, to change people's hearts and minds and lives. And therefore, these two disciples assume, Jesus' logical next step must be to use his power to rule over the world. And they want a piece of that kind of power. James and John come up to Jesus and they say, let us sit next to you on your right hand and your left. They ask Jesus, we want to know what that's like. Jesus responds with a word of explanation. To know what that kind of power is like, he tells them, you also have to know what weakness is like. Can you drink the cup that I drink? He asks, can you be baptized with the the way I have been baptized? Can you drink a cup which includes suffering 
and being made fun of and dying? Can you be baptized with a baptism that involves going down into the water, letting go completely of the way you were and rising up a new person? Can you do those things? Jesus asks them. Are you able? He can. James and John tell him, we are able. If that's what it takes to know what it's like to have power, then we can do that too. When the other disciples hear this conversation between Jesus and their friends, they get pretty mad. Conversations about power and who gets it and who doesn't have a tendency, you may have noticed this election season, they have a tendency to make people mad. And so Jesus reminds all of his community that they are to live by a different set of rules. To be great, he tells them, be a servant. To be first, be a slave. Do not wait to be served, but serve. Give away your life. Then, and only then, Jesus seems to be saying, you will know what it's like to be me. It's not that Jesus has no power. Far from it. It's that power to Jesus means something radically different than what it does to James and John. For Jesus, in the way he lives and dies and rises and ministers, power and love are inextricably connected. You can't have one without the other. And this is something that many of Jesus' followers, even to this day, are well aware of. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King put it like this. He writes, Power without love is reckless. It's abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power without love is reckless and abusive. Love without power is sentimental and anemic. If power wants to change the world for the better, it needs love. But if love wants to make any change at all in the world, it needs power, the ability to make a difference, that kind of power. Jesus combines God's love with God's power paradoxically by serving in solidarity alongside people. To paraphrase the reading that we heard from Hebrews this morning, Jesus' power sits on a throne of grace, sharing mercy, sharing love from a sacred place of one who sympathizes with our weaknesses, one who knows, who knows what it's like. We learn something about what it's like to be Jesus, not when we have it all, know it all, control it all, but in those times in our life when we don't. And the challenge, as Jesus points out, is that most of us are not willing to put us put ourselves in that place of relative weakness unless we absolutely have to. We like to be in control. And so we say with the disciples, Jesus, we are able to do these things too, but more often than not, we don't change a thing unless life forces a change upon us. There's a New Testament theologian named Dwight Peterson who died in 2016 who knows a little something about that kind of weakness. Dr. Peterson lived as a paraplegic for 30 years. And after those 30 years, he began to die and he went into hospice care and reflected while he was there on what his way of living and dying had taught him about being a follower of Jesus. I'm going to see a video now that 
shares some of Dr. Peterson's reflections on this passage from Mark, where Jesus says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. His reflections on how powerlessness can draw us closer to Jesus and power can. I wrestled with whether to show you this video because this person, this theologian, is on hospice, and so there's lots of machines in the room. So he's a little hard to hear, but I think it's worth it. If you're willing to not hold on to your need for the sound to be perfect, I invite you to take a listen to what Dr. Peterson has to say. Testament, I think you, you have to come to the conclusion that power is a problem. God, we can't print this. You can't print the That's power is a problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, power is a problem in that. Uh, passage I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about uh, a story in Mark 10 where the disciples are chatting among one another and they're deciding who's going to be who's going to sit at Jesus' right hand and, and his left hand and Jesus catches him at it and uh, he talks about the way that the Gentiles as he calls them Lord Lord power over their subjects and he looks at his disciples and he says you don't do that and then he gives himself as an example the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many that whole idea about the cross dying and through the cross changing everything It's a different kind of power than most of us think about. And I have to say, you know, power is is intriguing. It's something that draws people toward it. And I think part of the gospel is to help draw you away from li for living for power. Another way to say it is that weakness can be good. Weakness can be something for which we ought to strive. And if you're weak, I think you're a little bit more like Jesus than you might otherwise be. Well, 
well. For me, it's just sort of been easy. I am weak. And the older I get, the weaker I get. Um, I suppose... I suppose for people who are strong, that's a challenge to be weak. It's a challenge to not to struggle for power, not to try to be in charge, not to um, try to be the one that makes everything happen. But I think, I mean, I know people. And Dr. Peterson's comments about weakness as one of the portals through which we pass to understand Jesus, I find that compelling. Power is a problem. And it is especially a problem when it is uncoupled from love. So this week, notice Notice what happens when you are able to acknowledge your human weakness. And if you are sitting there thinking, I don't have any human weakness, then I would invite you to watch the video of the sermon one more time. Notice what happens when you are able to acknowledge your human weakness. Notice what God is doing when you decide you do not have to be the one in charge. Notice what happens in your life and in the world when you set down that role of being the person who makes everything happen and you rise up from the baptism of powerlessness as a new person. If Dr. Peterson is right, and I think he is, when you do these things, you will notice as well more kindness more gentleness, more ability to say to the world around you and even to Jesus himself, I know what it's like.